What's up, everybody? Have you ever wondered why music is so powerful? I want to share my thoughts on why I think music sets people free, why I think that we can be salt and light in our art. We're going to talk about it right now on Cooper Stuff. Today we're going to do something a little bit different uh, because two comments I saw on the social media got me thinking. One, someone had asked, last week we talked about salt and light. Remember that? And uh, I was talking about in my personal music how I don't always talk about my faith blatantly in my music. And someone had asked something to the, the effect of um, how do you see you know your role in this, the songs that you make? Uh, and your opinions on that. And I thought that was a great question, something that I would like to share with art in general. Secondly, someone sent a message saying, hey, Cooper stuff is, is good, but will you talk about some things that are about other issues besides Christianity? Because a lot of people watching might not be Christians, which makes me actually thrilled. Uh, and I thought, you know what? I should be doing a little bit more of that. So today, I, of course, I'm going to always talk about my faith because everything that I you know, think is going to be through my uh, worldview and, and, and my faith and, and the way that I you know, live out what I believe. So I can't get away from that, of course, but I would like to talk about a few um, other things to do with music because someone specifically said that, that John, that's me, John uh, always says that I write music not just for Christian people, but I write music for all kinds of people, and that is absolutely true. I want to share with you why that is, and, uh, and I am going to share from the Bible of why that is and what I believe is so powerful about music. But before we jump into it, we got to do this. It's fresh! Let me tell you what's fresh. I bet some of you guys are tired of hearing about this, but check it out. I got the uh, physical copy of the deluxe version of Eden. Some people are probably sick of this now. Maybe some people are listening and not watching. Uh, if you're watching, you see this beautiful beard. I'm just joking. Some people are like, John, we're going to trim your beard. I don't know. That just makes me want to grow it more. Anyway, if you are watching, you can see this. If you're not watching, uh, then you're missing out. But Eden is the first book that I ever wrote, and uh, I co-wrote it, actually, but it's the first thing that I've ever had a concept with writing a story. It is a comic book. Actually, it's called a graphic novel, which is different, uh, but it's a really cool story. You can get it on Amazon and stuff, but this is the deluxe version, and you can't see how big it is. Here, let me do this. Let me hold my Bible up next to it so you get an idea of how massive this thing is. Look at that, and uh, it's cool. Check it. It opens like this. Here's the book. And uh, it just looks so good in person. Every once in a while, you create something that you don't think is going to be as good when you see it in person. Look how great these, the, the pictures look. So, But this thing really w blew my uh, expectations away. It's really cool. And uh, I'm very proud of it. It's a s supernatural story. It has a lot of spiritual uh, overtones to it. A lot of action, stuff like that. So... Very excited about the deluxe version. I do need to say that a lot of the fans pre-ordered this, especially like with the album of Victorious, and it took about 10,000 years to get printed, and it was it was like super late. I am very sorry, everybody. We had nothing to do with it. It was actually printed in China, and we had issues with stuff there that was beyond our control, but they're here, and everybody that has them is like, that took a long time to get, but it's awesome. So everybody seems to love it. So that's what's fresh. They're limited edition as well. There's only about 200 left as the time I'm recording this. And you can get them on Z2 Comics. It's fresh. It's fresh. All right. So here we are. We are talking about something that I love, as you know, music. Music is, to me, one of the best things in the whole world my whole life. Music has been something that speaks to me. Uh, in a way that other things do not. Uh, music is different than even speech. I mean, speech is wonderful, but music cuts straight to the soul and, and the spirit. Um, we don't exactly know why. I am going to talk about some Bible stuff today because it's impossible for me to talk about music with, without it. But I also am going to share a lot of my opinions on the way that I see music being powerful. Um, music makes people feel not so alone. 
And uh, uh, people have asked me for years, why do you write the songs that you write? I always say this. You probably heard me say it if you've ever heard a Skillet interview, that I don't want to write music only to Christian people. I want to write music for people. I want to write music that helps people through their lives. When people are feeling alone and they are feeling like no one in the world understands them, um, that's what music did for me. Uh, it might sound silly to some people, but I remember growing up feeling like an outcast, feeling marginalized, feeling uh, invisible, whatever that word is, fighting with my my parents and and wanting to find my own identity, whatever you want to call it. Growing up is, is hard. And I remember uh, night after night after night for years, all that I wanted to do was get to my room, put on my big, you know, big headphones and listen to music because music made me feel better. Uh, I always felt that, that if I was sad, music would make me feel happy. It would help me forget my problems. It would take me out of myself. Something about the emotion and the music, something about the passion. And I've had the privilege of meeting thousands, literally thousands and thousands of people who share their stories with me about how music has helped them, about how my music has helped them. And to be honest, it's always really humbling. I'm always like, really? My music? Because, uh, you know, other people's music healed me growing up. I believe that music heals. It heals the soul. It heals from hurt. It heals scars. Um, but it's amazing and humbling to me to know that my music has done that for somebody. When you are writing a song, I don't think for most songwriters, certainly not for me. I never write a song and be like, this is the song that's going to save somebody's life. Never imagine such a thing because I don't think so highly of myself. I just think this is a song that means something to me. I want to write about the struggles I've been through so that it can help someone else. And I hope that it helps them. But when I meet people uh, that say this song saved my life, this song got me off of drugs. Some of the craziest stories, some of the weirdest songs. You know, I met uh, probably a dozen people who said that oh, we have a song called Sick of It. Are you sick of it? Yeah. Um, from an album called Rise. And I never imagined that somebody would hear the song Sick of It on the radio and then say, that's it. I'm sick of my drug problem and check themselves into rehab and but got clean and sober based on this rock song. I was amazed to meet people that said these kind of things. Music heals people. Now, where does music come from? An amazing thing, we don't really know in terms of history where music came from. It, it just kind of like is. And uh, it, it, I think it's really cool. I believe that, uh, and again, someone I'm going to talk about today is going to be opinion. So so don't say John said it, it must have to be true from the Bible or something. This is opinion, but I, I kind of believe like if you were, you know, raised in the jungle by wolves, you know, jungle boy, that music would still be in, it's in the soul of man. I, I don't think that we can cut it off and say it's only like a learned behavior. We know that in the animal kingdom, birds and what have you, uh, naturally sing songs. I believe that music is something that's kind of inherent within man to do. Now, when we look at the Bible, it's not like the Bible says this is when music was created. This is how it began. But again, a lot of people, even Christians, we forget that the beginning of, uh, of creation in the Bible in Genesis 1 is not like the beginning of all, you know, that was. And, uh, it might be the beginning of what was for, for the human race, but it's not the beginning of what it was. And when we say that, of course, what we mean is that God is eternal and, and God exists outside of time and space. We know that God created time and space that we live in and, uh, and he, he moves through time and space to, to interact and to act. But he is not limited to it. He is infinite. He is an infinite God. So for all eternity past, you can't really say that, you know, uh, when music began because God exists outside of you. can't say it's 10 billion years old because God's existence is outside of years, all right? But we do know that music and worship was happening a long time before Genesis 1. We see uh, evidence uh, in the Bible. Again, we don't even know a lot about Lucifer, 
who people who follow the Christian faith know that Lucifer is was an, uh, an angel that fell, that we now call Satan, the devil, what have you. But we do know that Lucifer was the brightest of all angels that God had created. And we also have hints in the Bible that, that Lucifer was a, the chief musician. Maybe that means he was like a worship leader, if you want to look at it from that point of view. I find it really interesting that the most beautiful of all the angels that was created um, it was also the brightest of all angels that was created, was meant to bring glory to God, was also a musician or a worship leader, or maybe he gathered all the worship from heaven to present before God. I don't really understand that. I'm not going to try to understand that because that is way above my pay grade. But what it says to me is that there is a power in worship and a power in music that is is from, was before mankind. And we know from the Bible that music will go on for eternity in heaven, in worship. So there's something inherently powerful about it. What I think is really cool about music, again, is I believe that even if you were, you know, again, that raised by wolves in the jungle, never run any humans, that you would naturally begin to sing. You would naturally begin to hum. Now, this is my opinion, because I, but I believe that music is just in us. There's something beautiful about it. There's something transcendent about it, and I think that that is really wonderful. I believe that music drives out demons. I have met people at shows uh, religious people and non-religious people, still people that come up to me and they say, John, I am not a Christian. I'm not into the Jesus stuff at all, but your music healed me from sickness or your music healed me um, from uh, drug addiction. Your music healed me from my self-harm. I've met a lot of people like that. Your music healed me from the suicidal thoughts that I had. I was brokenhearted and your music is what got me through. We see this in science now, uh, and especially in the last couple of decades. Science and psychology has made an incredible um, uh, uh, psychological discoveries that music helps people with sickness. Uh, they call it music therapy sometimes in psychology. People that are suffering from various diseases, even like brain diseases, music helps soothe people. I met someone just last year. Uh, on tour, on the uh, Victorious tour just a few months back, probably four months ago, in America. I met someone, and, and I love meeting fans. I, all, I don't always remember what kind of conditions they had, whether they were uh, mental or physical, because I'm, I can't remember names, and I can't remember the names of sicknesses, okay? But something to do with a brain disease. I, I, it might have been an extreme form of autism. I can't remember. But I met him and his mom. And it was a situation where he uh, had 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 you know some some mental problems, and it was causing him to be violent at home. He didn't want to be, but he would get extremely violent and had to be hospitalized. And it seemed that the only thing that could bring peace to him in those violent moments was skillless music. And I was amazed to find this out. And I met him, and I met his mom. I can't remember what city. She was telling me about how when he would have these violent episodes, she would play our music and he would calm down. He was about 18 years old, I think. And she was crying. He was crying. I started crying because I'm amazed that, that my music is used for people like this. <coughs> An interesting thing, excuse me, in the Bible, I think it's really cool when science catches up to what we already know from the Bible. And why I say that is that Christians have always believed that music heals. We believe that because in the Old Testament, uh, a lot of people have heard of David, uh, even people that don't follow the, of the Bible or Christianity probably know the story of David and Goliath. It's a really popular Bible story. Well, David became king, and he is the one that wrote uh, about a third of the book of Psalms. We know lots and lots about David in, in the Bible as a king, but before he was a king, we know lots about David when he was a boy. We know David and Goliath, but we even know something about David before David and Goliath in which he was a shepherd and he would spend time out in the fields. Uh, he was a shepherding sheep, but he also was very brave. He fought a lion with his hands, the Bible says. Um, he would sing songs to God. He would write poems to God and he was a musician. And so he would play songs to God and he would play, the Bible says, skillfully before the Lord. And he, he also um, 
uh, like I say, he, he wrote songs to God and he was anointed by God to, um, to, well, as a prophet, actually. So, an incredible thing about this, at the time when David was a boy, the king was named Saul, and Saul was being tormented by demons, and he couldn't sleep, and he, and he asked that there would be a musician to come and play for him, and somebody said, you know what, I've heard of this boy David, and uh, he plays skillfully, he's anointed by God, so David came in to Saul, and he began to play skillfully, and was anointed by God's Spirit. And the demons would flee from Saul. And it's a really awesome story. You should check it out because it's one of the few stories we see about music and how the power of music delivers. So I believe that music does that from the Bible. I believe that it does it from experience because I experienced that kind of emotional healing growing up through music. And I've experienced it through my fans, people that I've met at shows from all walks of life, atheists, agnostics, other people from different religions as well. People that are like, you know, I've never even really thought about God, but I like the way your music makes me feel. I love that because whether you're a Christian or whether you're not, whether you ever become a Christian, I want my music to help you and I want my music to speak to you. So I want to read a scripture that very much describes the way that I view my music because a lot of Christians have wondered if you're going to write music to set people free, then shouldn't all of that music be about Jesus specifically? So let me read this to you. Uh, My awesome Bible, Matthew chapter five. Let's start verse uh, 45 Um, and starting in the middle of the verse, actually. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. Now, first of all, this is Jesus talking, okay? And um, if I could go back to scriptures just to give you context of what Jesus is talking about. He's actually talking about loving your enemies. And, And he's saying, basically, you've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies Pray for those who persecute you. Then people will know that you are children of your Father in heaven. He gives us sunlight to both the evil and the good. Uh, He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. This is what theologians call, um, this is a great scripture for uh, what they call common grace. And the idea about this is that God has a special grace that, again, theologians call saving grace. We know this scripture Christians probably know that you have been, it's, it's through grace you have been saved through, through Christ. They call that saving grace. And that is only known by people who have faith that, that, uh, that God is real and that Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead and that Jesus is God and we ask for repentance. We have faith in Christ. That is called saving grace. Common grace is an idea that God's goodness and his general graciousness um, is for everybody. Everybody on the earth, even people that reject him, even people that don't just reject him, but who hate him, his common grace is on their lives. And what common grace would mean would be, for instance, uh, someone who hates Jesus or is an enemy of God enjoys a sunrise just like a child of God would enjoy a sunrise. Uh, God gives food. If you've eaten today, that is a gift from God, whether you acknowledge that he's real or whether you reject that he's real, okay? We call that common grace. And I believe, and this is where we get, I mean, this is scripture, but it's a little bit my opinion, okay? I believe that the people of God should have a love for the world that speaks of God's common grace. Sometimes Christians can tend to, to think that if I, if I love the world and if, if these people reject God, then I no longer am going, I mean, they might love them theoretically, but they might not love them in terms of like meeting their needs or in terms of relationship. Maybe our friendship, uh, we don't really hang out anymore as friends because they've rejected Christ and maybe Christians find that offensive or they think, you know what, they've already rejected Christ. What is it worth to keep spending time for that relationship? I believe that we are meant to keep spending time for that relationship, if nothing else, just for the fact that we are to love people and show that we are children of God. Therefore, the grace that we have in our lives should spill out onto them 
sort of like in a way that you might say God's common grace does. In other words, the benefits of God that we experience as Christians, his righteousness, his peace, his joy in the Holy Spirit, which is the kingdom of God, the Bible says, that should spill out on everybody. And that means even people that reject God, maybe people that haven't don't know that they've rejected him, but they're not interested yet, or maybe they've not thought about it, they still get to experience the joy that we have in God. Um, they don't experience for themselves, but it flows out onto them. It makes their lives better. Does that make sense? So I view my music in a way sort of like that kind of, of common grace. I make music for people that even if they reject Christ, that's totally okay with me. I want them to have music that can lift them up to a higher place, that can help them transcend the battles that they face. That's why I write so many songs like Feel Invincible or Legendary that are about nothing is going to stop me because this world is dark and this world is depressing and people are constantly telling you that you can't make it, you're never gonna be good enough, you're never gonna be pretty enough, you're never gonna have what it takes. And I wanna write a song that says, hey, yes you do, there are still wonderful things in your life worth fighting for and your life is worth fighting for let me tell you this statistic just came out the cdc in america released this just this week uh well by the time you're watching this it might be uh five days later in the last 17 years in america suicide rates have risen 40 percent it's just astounding to me 40% more suicides in 2019 than there was 17 years ago, all right? This is, there is an epidemic of people who don't know how valuable they are. There is an epidemic of people that don't know how much God loves them. They don't know that they were created in the image of God. Even if they reject God, they were created in his image. And as an image bearer of God... God loves you and his common grace is on you. He wants you to enjoy life and enjoy your food, enjoy your freedom, enjoy the sunrise. He is good to you. He is gracious to you. And I want to write songs for people, even if they don't interpret them, that those songs are about Jesus. I want those songs to make people feel good. That is the way that I view the start of my ministry through my songs. That's why I don't care if people ever know those songs are about Jesus. I want it to spill out. Now, I want to show you why I think that the scriptures I mentioned last week, which is was about that we are the salt of the earth and that we have to go out into the world as salt and light. If you remember, if you listened last week, if you didn't, go back and listen because you might dig it. God tells us that we Christians are supposed to be salt and light in the world. Salt means that we are to spread out like a disinfectant of purity to help save the world from putrefaction, if you will. It also says that we are supposed to be the light of the world. We're going out into darkness and we are supposed to be light, almost like a beacon of light, that we would be different. And that we would show the way. The Bible says that the word of God is a light into my my uh, my path, right? A lamp into my feet, a light to my path. That light shouldn't be just for you. It should be for others to see. Let me explain to you why I believe that even my music uh, being kind of common for all people, left to interpretation, can be salt and light. First of all, we live in a glorious time of social media. Social media has a lot of stupid stuff about it, a lot of stuff that I hate, a lot of stuff that I think, frankly, is literally ruining society and ruining lives. I really do believe that. But it exists, and everybody uses it, and that's just the way it's going to be. A good part of social media is that you can have a platform to say what you believe. So for Skillet, what I think is really cool is that even though my songs are not specifically all about Jesus, it's left to interpretation, which I really like. I see that like the common grace of God spreading to everybody, right? Even though that's the case, I like to vocalize my faith right here on Cooper Stuff. On my Instagram, every interview I do, I talk about my faith in Christ. Through my marriage, people know that I am a Christian. They know what we're about. In other words, I think a lot of people hear Skillet's music 
and they go, oh, I interpret that in my own way. Maybe I'm not a Christian. Maybe I'm not religious. I interpret it in my own way, but I kind of know what John means when he says it. I think that that is like a beacon of light. And that's the way I see it. And I love that because what I want to say to those people is there's a beacon of light here. When I sing my song, Hero, my hero is Jesus, and he has given me a reason to live. I believe he can give you a reason to live also. People know that that's what I mean. But I also want to tell them, <clears throat> if you reject that idea in Jesus, that's fine with me. I still, We're still friends. We can still hang out. We can still love each other. We can still have dinner and break bread together. I still want you to find a hero for something that you believe in because I, I love you. And because God loves you because you are an image bearer and I want you to experience his common grace and enjoy it. That's a really great thing. And just maybe in experiencing that common grace, you might find a God who is so gracious and is so good to you that it might lead you to wanting more of him. Because common grace is wonderful, but saving grace is the most wonderful thing that has ever been. It is the reason to live because he gives us a brand new life. So that is one way that I see my music as being a light to people. Now, I wanna share the very final thing with you of why I believe <clears throat> that through my music, how I can be sought. Because as I said last week, just being in the world, doing music in the world as a Christian is not actually being sought, that you're just out there in the world. Well, how do I think that through the music that I can do that, I find that the salt part of the equation and in my art and in my life, honestly, is the most important part to me. What I mean by that is this. If you go out and talk about Jesus, but you do not live a life that looks like Jesus, no one will listen to you. No one will care because you will be a hypocrite. Everybody hates hypocrites, all right? Sometimes you see me on here when I start making fun of People who, uh, like in politics, they always say one thing and they end up doing another. And I like to make fun of it because uh, it, it, we all can't stand when somebody is constantly preaching and then you find out they have not been living up to what they said they wanted to do. Now listen, all of us make mistakes, me included, but we have to own those mistakes. And then we have to, we can't say, yeah, but I, you know what? I'm human. That's just the way it is. We have to say, you're right. I messed up, but I want to live a life consistent with that. I always tell people this in the music business or in the world, I believe in the business world. This is my opinion. If you talk about Jesus, the world, you know, won't necessarily hate you. They might even like it. They might even think it's really cool. Uh, they might love that you talk about Jesus, think you're awesome for it. The difference is, is that if you live a life consistent with loving Jesus, the world will get annoyed with you. The world will hate you. They will get tired of seeing it because it, the truth is, is it's cool to be into Jesus, just like it's cool to be into Buddha or it's cool to be into, you know, whatever person, you know, fights for people's rights, Gandhi or what have you. Um, people kind of dig that because spiritualism is looked at by the world as cool. But if you live a standard of righteousness, then people don't always really love that. And that's what I, that's where I believe people get really annoyed. How I see myself as salt in the world is that I don't just talk about Jesus, but I am, for instance, faithful to my wife. You'll never be backstage at a Skillet concert and see me, you know, hitting and flirting with another girl. You'll never see me, you know, interested in getting attention from, uh, you know, other women and things like that. Nor will you ever see my wife doing those sort of things. Uh, because that is what it means to be a follower of Christ. It means that I, I, that God has brought a purity to my life, and I have to ask Him every day, Lord, by Your Spirit, will You help me? You know, walk in Your Spirit, that I will have the strength to live a life consistent with what You have actually done in my heart. You see, the problem with a lot of of, of Christians is that we don't walk in the Spirit. Maybe we have been saved. And maybe we have been, uh, you know, redeemed in Christ. So listen, if you're redeemed in Christ, then you are righteous before God. That's not something that you can do. That is something that he does. But if you don't walk in the spirit on a daily basis, you will find yourself walking in the flesh is what, how the Bible says it. And what that means is that, that, that if you walk in the flesh, 
then you are still gratifying your flesh. You might be saved, you might be righteous before Christ, but you are living a life inconsistent with what God has actually done in your heart. So when we live by the Spirit, God uh, gives us the power to overcome that sin in that moment. And by doing so, then we become salt in the earth because we don't partake with the sins of the flesh. So that is the way for people that want to know, I'm not saying that every Christian musician needs to follow my path. I would say that every Christian musician and every Christian ever needs to be salt in the earth. Okay. And that doesn't mean that you have to live a perfect life. You won't live a perfect life, but does not mean that you have to feel guilty for all the times you haven't done it? There is no condemnation in Christ, the Bible says, but what it means is that we should be asking God to help us live a life that is consistent with what the Holy Spirit has actually done in us, which is that he has given us a brand new life, a brand new heart, righteousness in Christ. So I'm not saying that every Christian musician needs to be a light in the way that I see myself being a light. Some Christian musicians feel that they should talk about Jesus in every song they sing, and I think that's wonderful. I think it's awesome. For me, I want to write songs that everyone can relate to, and even if those songs <clears throat> never change someone in terms of their their ultimate faith in Christ, to me it is still worthy of doing because that is the way that I can love the world. That is the way that I can help the world. For all you people listening who are not Christians and are not religious at all, my songs are for you. And if you're not into Jesus, that's totally fine with me. I want you to be healed through the music. I want the, the music to help you transcend the loneliness that you might feel, the emptiness that you might feel, um, the suicidal thoughts that you might have, the self-harm that you might be going through, the divorce you might be going through, the divorce your parents might be going through. I want my music to be healing to you in the same way that young David in the Bible played music that was healing to Saul and drove out your demons. That's what I would like my music to do. I hope that you listen to it. Ultimately, I pray that you come not just to realization of God's common grace, but God's saving grace for you because healing from this life is really good, but healing for all of eternity and a brand new heart in Christ is what it's all about. That is what this entire world is about. That is the reason that we feel so empty on the inside because we are longing for eternity. And I believe that is true for every human from all time that has ever existed. Thanks so much for watching Cooper Stuff. Keep rocking with Skillet. Later. Mm, mm, hallelujah. Woo. Cooper Stuff.